Senator Mike Stewart. He is uh, a candidate for higher office, as they say in the state, the attorney general's position. And he's in town today. Michael, good morning to you. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. What brings you around these parts today? Hey, we're on a campaign swing. And uh, we were in Inwood yesterday, had a uh, big meet and greet. Uh, went and spoke with Gateway Republican women after that. And, uh, and so we're here for the rest of the day. And then we'll be back in the uh, Ohio Valley mm -hmm. and then back in the Kanawha uh, Valley. And so I appreciate being here. It's great to have you in the studio, man. We love it whenever the candidates are around town mm -hmm. that they can uh, pop in and do a in-studio appearance, those are always, I think, a lot more effective than just on the telephone. Well, I've been here a lot. I'm starting to learn my way around without the GPS. All right. And I can find the Dunkin' Donut around the corner and find my way back. <laughs> You've arrived, Mike. You've arrived. <laughs> did, 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 did we notice he came back from Dunkin' Donuts empty-handed? That's right, that. yeah. Well, has, he has not gotten the word. Everybody else seems to be getting the He's word. He's running a frugal, tight campaign, yeah. I'm telling you. Unless but, I'm being outspent to millions. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right? Well, I don't There's care. There's no donut budget. I was <laughs> going to say, I don't care about that, Mike. I'm just looking at it from a very... Uh, perspective from Rob and Matt and myself. Yeah. We, we've gotten used to donuts in the morning. Yeah, it's, it's, well, there's some stale ones out there from a couple of days ago. You know, uh, Mike, let's talk about fundraising and, and what it's like trying to run a statewide campaign. How's it been for you? You know what? So it's interesting. So I don't spend all my time on the fundraising side. Uh, I've been fortunate during the course of my life. I'm not wealthy with fame or uh, money, but I've been, I have enough to run a good, strong campaign. And so I think we've done, we've been pretty effective. My average donor, though, is not the $2,800 donor that you'll find from some folks. My average donor, even yesterday, I mean, every day I'm getting in that 20, 25, 50, $100 donor. What I love about that are the notes I get with those dollars, which say, hey, anything I can do for you. Had a 14-year-old reach out to me. 14-year-old gave me $25 and said, I live here in Summers County. Uh, anything I can do for you, I've been following your campaign. I'm interested in politics. I love those types of stories. And uh, I'll get notes. In fact, I got a, a stack of 2 and 5 and $10 checks. And a lot of folks say, boy, that's, that's not that much money. No, it's a lot of money for folks who make those $2, $5, and $10 checks. Oh, yeah. It's tough right now between inflation and gasoline prices that are soaring again and utility rates. And you have a lot of folks in places, especially in West Virginia, uh, that are having trouble getting by month to month. You may not see it as much here, but when you get south of places like Martinsburg and Charlestown, when you get to places like Kanawha County and Logan and Hamlin and Hinton, these are folks who don't have the economic vitality that you have here that are struggling just to survive every single day. And for those folks to come in with those $2, $5, $10 uh, donations, one, they're passionate to vote for you. And uh, two, you got to admire that uh, they take a couple dollars to give to your campaign. Mike, I want to ask you about the ad that your wife has voiced mm -hmm. for your campaign. It provided, I think, a different touch to the Mike Stewart campaign because before that, most of your ads were built on a Mike Stewart. I was a federal prosecutor under Donald Trump uh, for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, I'm tough on crime. I'm going to be. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You're not going to get away with this under my watch. And your wife comes in, takes a much different approach with her ad, and sort of paints you as a caring human being, a great family man, that sort of thing. And uh, tell me about that a little bit. You know, it's, 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 so family, faith and family are really important to us. And I, we, I talked to her a lot. She wanted to do this ad uh, because she said, I, I, you, you're, you're painted as this tough, unempathetic, tough, lock em up prosecutor who's just gruff. And that's not what I see. That's not what I've seen. And she said, I think people need to see what I've seen. And and to be honest, I didn't want her to do the ad. I, 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 uh, I like the persona of being tough. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I'm a pretty empathetic guy. That's why I carry those pictures in my wallet. And things change you during the course of your life. And when she was diagnosed with cancer, uh, independent uh, cancers in both breasts, that was a tough couple of years, and it changes the way you look at the world. Sure does. And uh, family is everything to us. And But she wanted to do that ad. Uh, I, I debated, uh, and I let, uh, I let the listeners judge it. Uh, I'm, I'm conflicted between wanting to say, hey, I'm the tough prosecutor, 
And my wife says, knock it off. Knock it off, <laughs> right? And, so and we always listen to our wives. Well, the tough prosecutor at home is my wife. <laughs> and uh, so when I did that big takedown in Huntington, that 250 law enforcement officers on the streets, 100 defendants we were targeting, I came home thinking, wow, I'm the champion today. And as soon as I got in the door, she said, don't forget to take the garbage out today. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's wonderful. I appreciate that she did that. We've been mm -hmm. together uh, 30 years, more than 30 years. I've got a daughter graduating next month from, uh, from college, Cornell, of all places, where a lot of these protests are yeah. popping up. And uh, she's doing incredibly well. And I've got my other daughter starts at Marshall's Med School uh in july and so we, we just couldn't be more proud and so politics is not our focus right i'm mm -hmm. involved in politics i like to try to help people given my background and things have happened in my life but for me it's really about family i don't get my validation at the ballot mm -hmm. box and i see too many of these people i think who do and so i'm pretty centered in that respect if i win on election night great uh, we'll go on to the general election if we lose uh, either way, we're doing uh, Myrtle Beach for vacation, and so. Uh, uh, but uh, Before, I appreciate those comments. Bill goes. Uh, is, was your Senate seat up as well? If, no. If, if, so you could still be a, a state senator. I'll still be a state senator for at least uh, the next two years, and uh, but I'm going to be the attorney general, and so I'll have to vacate that seat at the end of the year. But listen, that that's a that's a. I'm one of the fortunate folks that my election cycle falls in the off year. Mm -hmm. And so the way it looks like, I serve in a key post on judiciary. Uh, if the election falls the right way, who knows, I could be judiciary chair. I'm pretty active in that capacity. So either way, uh, I feel pretty fortunate. And uh, I think I'm a, a really worthy candidate for attorney general, but I'm, I'm a realist here, right? When you get out spent a million dollars, a million dollars, that's a lot of money where I'm from. <laughs> Uh, but we've been incredibly effective about our spending. I always have been. And I've never been in a campaign where I haven't been outspent two or three to one. I don't want I, I don't want the folks I know to cross the street away from me because they see me coming. I don't want to shake people down for money. I need enough money to run a campaign beyond that. I'm not into the, the power game of massive uh, campaign dollars. I think people are turned off. I think... Folks have lost faith in Republicans and Democrats. It feels like it's all about the money and power and who's in charge. And I really am about people in little white houses with white picket fences trying to make their lives a little better. That's I, I really believe that. Maybe it's because of the way I was raised. Billy? Yeah, uh, you've given me two or three things I'd like to ask you about, Mike. Uh, and I do want to come back to the differences between you and JB, mm -hmm. your, your opponent. Uh, what are the fundamental differences? But I was, like Rob, struck by your wife's ad. There's been only other, one other ad that I've heard this whole cycle that breaks through all the sameness that everything else has and that's one by uh, uh by one of the guys running for state senate uh, mike folk running against uh, craig blair he has a very humorous ad i think is effective what makes for an effective ad mike i think it has to be genuine and uh i don't know listen i'm, I'm just an ordinary guy but I, i'm tired of the fakeness in politics i really am i think it i i know people use terms like uniparty I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I just mean it doesn't feel to me like most people have faith in our system anymore, that it works, that there's any big difference between who wins. You know, I think turnout in this election, uh, if you look at what happened in Ohio, a super expensive $30 million U.S. Senate campaign, one of the biggest in the history of Ohio, they had less than 22% turnout. And so I think people want to hear genuine Right. They, you don't need to be perfect. They don't need but to yet, agree with you all but, the time, but they want to hear genuine. But yet you've made several ads. Yeah. And with the exception of your wife's ad, they have not risen above all the other ads. That's my point. How do you find how do you hit that chord that resonates with people that says that is different than all the other ads? Well, I'll tell you what I do on my ads. I do all the talking on my ads, and they are sincere ads and genuine ads. People may hear them as just another ad, but uh, I don't have production companies. I write all my own stuff. I typically do it in one take or two takes. It's me. And uh, so I, I I realize I'm not – I'm a strong cup of dark coffee. I get it. And that's not the flavor everybody wants, but I, I just – I'm comfortable in my own skin uh, I joke about this all the time, like that wonderful ad my, my wife put out, but 
you know, we're your typical marriage. Like, we don't like each other half the time, but we've been married for 30 years. We love each other dearly. We're a great team. Uh, but we just are who we are. And I, I, I guess I've gotten to the point in my life where I don't try to be anything other than who I am. And if folks like me, great. If they don't, I get it. And, and uh, But, uh, yeah, I think genuine is the key. And I've always been genuine. I know it doesn't perhaps play the best with folks who don't like that genuine view I have of the world. Uh, but I think people are tired of the production companies and the consultants and uh, the experts telling them what to think and what to say. I want to go back to what you talked about with the importance of family, and I know that one of your priorities in this campaign is to support parents and families. How can you do that from this office as Attorney General? So I think it's one of the important things you do as Attorney General. I think that is uh, on issues of parents' priority, whether it's education. I believe in vaccine freedom. I realize that some people are against that. Uh, I don't think we should take it to uh, the logical extreme. You can always carry every one of these arguments to logical extremes. Listen, I think it's reasonable for parents to be engaged in what they're learning in the classroom. I think it's reasonable for parents to be engaged in what their kids are putting in their arms and the way their kids behave at school and the way they're being disciplined. As Attorney General, one, I'll use the bully pulpit uh, for that role. Uh, but two, it's critical, whether it's the use of the federal courts and the federal overreach that comes from Washington. But even with respect to Charleston, there's some confusion here. I know my opponent has said he wants to help the governor and aid the governor. There's a reason we independently elect the attorney general. It's, it's not an agent of the governor or any other position in state government. It's, it's role, the role of the attorney general, one role. It's to protect the people of West Virginia, to represent the people of West Virginia. Wherever I can, I want to help the governor advance the legislative agenda. But first and foremost, that's why we elect an attorney general independent of these operators, is so that the attorney general can represent the best interests of the people of West Virginia. And if that attorney general doesn't do that, next cycle they'll throw him out. And so you just can't use the power of that office willy-nilly. But uh, my, my view on this is the attorney general needs to be an independent player, whether it's for parents, whether it's protecting the Second Amendment rights, whether it's the ability to drill frack and mine. That attorney general is going to have to be incredibly active in those federal courts. And you better be a darn good lawyer. And if you're not a good lawyer and surround yourself with good lawyers, I think you're going to have real problems in that office. You mentioned uh, as well already federal overreach and uh, something that uh, our current AG has talked about and has fought as well. Uh, how do you maybe see yourself different in what we've had in that office in, in fighting that overreach? Well, I'm going to be quite consistent with the way Patrick Morrissey's operated in that office uh, in terms of being aggressive. Now, I also believe in consumer protection. I think consumer protection, we've got to beef up the office in terms of consumer protection. I think a lot of consumers don't know where to go. I'll give you an example. I won't name the company, but there's one of these companies now, and they sent me a notice about a month and a half ago, and they said, hey, we're going to add a $1.99 fee if you don't go electronic on your statements. Every month, you're going to get that $1.99 fee. Well, I called and said, hey, I don't want this $1.99 fee. I want it to go away. Make it go away. And so they set it up. Well, the next month, I got a credit card statement. And Darn what you know, that $1.99 fee was on there. And they said, hey, you have to go online and sign up. And I said, how's the 87-year-old woman from Hinton who doesn't have the Internet supposed to do this? That's a great example of where I will, on behalf of all those folks similarly situated around West Virginia, take action against that company. That's predatory in my view. Give you another example, Walt Disney. I'll throw out their name. Maybe they're an advertiser of yours. They're not. <laughs> but but, <laughs> but let me say this. Uh, there are a lot, we, we have investments in West Virginia. All of us as West Virginians, we, we make investments with our investment management board. When companies like Walt Disney are making decisions not in the best interests of maximizing their shareholder value of their stock, but are making decisions on the basis of wokeness and gender identity, other motives which don't speak to value, they harm the value of the stock that we've invested in. There's something called, and it's called a stockholder derivative suit. No attorney general in, in, in the United States has ever brought a class action stockholder derivative suit against these companies for their woke identity agendas. 
These companies should be doing one thing, maximizing the value of the investments West Virginians have in their stock. And when they drive their stock price from $200 a share down to $90 a share, they bear responsibility for not focusing on running their business and, 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 and instead trying to run a, a social agenda out of their companies. That's just another example of where we're going to be incredibly active, perhaps creatively so. But I think if you look at Disney and a number of other companies where you see these activities, there is real damage to the people of West Virginia because we own investments in these companies and they bear responsibility for these decisions. But can the people in West Virginia really relate to that argument, Mike? Plus the fact when you and others throw out the term woke, nobody really knows what that means. It's becoming a political buzzword without any really teeth to it. Well, I think people know what woke is. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't believe so. You ask the definition, they'll come up, they'll be all across the board. I've heard the term a hundred times, I have absolutely no idea what it means. Yeah, so I think, so here, here's my view on that issue of woke. I do think a lot of people in Little White Houses, white picket fences, know exactly what it means. But here's what they do know, is that they don't want their companies being social activists. And they don't want the boardrooms to be social activists. So they don't want our school systems to be social activists. You know what we want out of our schools? We want our kids to learn. And we want them to advance as good citizens and to grow up and to have opportunity, whether it's vocational opportunities or college opportunities. I think folks are frustrated with the, the new social engineering that they see across our country. They look at college campuses today. They're frustrated, right? They're frustrated. That transgender case, I don't think anybody uh, wants to discriminate or treat uh, badly somebody that, that, that is in a gender identity crisis. But what they don't want are those boys playing on the girls' sports team or being in the girls' locker room. So I think at the end of the day, everybody's pretty fair about these things. I, I think people are pretty fair-minded about these things. But that case, it's interesting. Those fifth graders that decided in Shinston, West Virginia, near Clarksburg, to, they decided not to play when, that, when the boy was allowed to play on the sports team. They're, they're going to be punished, it looks like, by their athletic director and those folks who are involved. But you know what's unfair? We look at college campuses today and Hamas-loving, America-hating, flag-burning students who are foreigners into our colleges and universities are allowed to shut down universities. It appears without consequence. This is the thing, that, that unfairness, that dilemma of inequity that I think a lot of folks get frustrated with. I look at the problems that we in West Virginia have, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of them. And I cannot believe as far as putting bread on the table or uh, our comfort of life that some of these social engineering issues that politicians make so much hay out of really affect us as citizens. We don't really aware of it until you tell us we should be aware of it. No, listen, so I think at the end of the day, I think most people are concerned about putting food on the table. But I think when you look at the plethora of issues, all of those issues that get piled up together, it's hard to avoid some of those social issues, whether it's we, the Second Amendment. Except for the p campaign season. Do you ever hear about them? I think people notice these things all the time. And so I think people are real. I, th I think when the economy's bad, focus goes on all of these other issues. Uh, I do think we spend too much time too little time talking about the economy. I think people are really hurting right now. Uh, but I think it's also an administration that, from a social standpoint, has been bad for America as well. And so this administration, the Biden administration, I'll give you the Second Amendment, a great example. A lot of people care about their ability to hunt, their ability to carry concealed weapon. A lot of people worried about crime. And I know people will tell you that crime statistics are dropping. That's not the way Americans feel. It's yeah, not. but I, do, I don't think the typical citizen put the First and the Second Amendment in the same category as, social, as a discussion on social engineering. Yeah, clarify. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm just parroting what you said yeah. just a second ago. You said that the social engineering, all these companies, social engineering, we have to be, we have to be uh, on guard about it. My argument is, my point is, we have so many other things we need to be concerned about, and it's only the politicians that tell us we should be aware of woke issues, social engineering issues, that we think that we should do it. 
Uh, uh, so I think it's an interesting point that you make. You know, it's back in 2016, a lot of folks, because I'm real conservative, some people question whether Trump's a, a, a true conservative or not. It was 2016, and somebody said, I can't believe you, Stuart, that you, being the conservative you are, would come in and endorse President Trump, or Trump at the time and work for his campaign. But I heard somebody say, and, and this was a very profound statement, President Trump, Donald Trump at the time, he was not a leading indicator of America. He was a lagging indicator. He reflected what we'd become. Politicians are typically lagging indicators. What do I mean by that? They reflect what they're hearing on the streets, on Main Street, when they're talking to Aunt Martha, when they're talking to Uncle James. That, so, so these issues, the Second Amendment, uh, issues that are happening in our college campuses, People do talk about this at their dinner table. They talk about it when they talk about how expensive gasoline is, when they can't afford their electricity uh, to turn on that air conditioner or to heat their home. But they also that, talk about the Second Amendment as well. Mike, we're just about out of time. Here's your time to talk to our audience and tell them why they should vote for you for Attorney General. Well, and so I love that discussion. We could go on for a long time. But this is an important race, Attorney General. It's going to be extraordinarily low turnout. And I'll say this. Whoever votes, you have disproportionate power. There are significant differences between me and my opponent. I, I don't demonize my opponent. We know each other. But in terms of your attorney general, we're not electing the school patrol. We're not electing your sixth grade class president. This is serious business that affects your family. On the Second Amendment, I've been 100% clear I support it. He's voted four times against the Second Amendment. On religious freedom, I've been very clear. In our debate, he was very clear. He voted against religious freedom when he was in the legislature. When it comes to fairness, West Virginia, the transgender issue, my opponent, he's funded and supported strongly Steve Skinner and that uh, Fairness West Virginia agenda. I just disagree with it. I respect that there are differences of opinion. But listen, I'm going to be your economic attorney general, too, which is the EPA today is taking actions we haven't seen ever before. Just last week, they took actions that would shut down every coal-fired power plant, natural gas power plant over the next 10 years. We're losing baseload. While we're increasing green opportunities, and I'm not against that, but we have to be smart or we're going to have brownouts here. You need somebody like me who knows how to work in the federal courts, who's consistent with the values of West Virginia. I need people to get to the polls. It's going to be extraordinarily low turnout. I need you to get to the polls. You need somebody like me to protect your back. I think it's critically important. And go to makewvgreat.com, makewvgreat.com. And, yes, I need that $5, $10, $20 contribution so I can compete. Mike, thank you for being here today. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Have a great day. 